it's a privilege for me to step into uh, Chris's very large shoes. Uh, in this, I've, Gretchen and I have known each other well longer than either of us would like to admit. Uh, back to the early days of the natural capital concept and the production of, I think, what the first book, uh, Natural Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris noted that I've worked in complementary ways, and that's with an I. Uh, we are WWF, which I was with for many years, has been a core partner in natural ca in the natural capital project. Uh, and more broadly, I am personally a very big fan of this concept. And I, I think I want to start there. I mean, I, I, Chris noted that this is it's one of the most transformational concepts of the last. I don't know if you put a time period on, but I would say of the last 20 years in conservation, one of the real breakthroughs has been the concept of natural capital, and it, and it comes more than any more than anywhere from from Gretchen and Gretchen's work and her passionate leadership of uh, of this effort. So, so I want to start the conversation there. I, I just take us a little bit back into the origins of natural capital. I mean, what was what were the insights that led you to this concept, this way of thinking about things, and 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 actually, how did you crystallize that in this idea of natural capital? Hey, well, um, <laughs> let me first start off by thanking everybody for coming. And um, thanking Chris for that extremely generous and exaggerated um, <laughs> introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it, but I'll, I'll try to set the record straight a little bit here now. And <clears throat> um, it's, it's terrific to do this with you, Jim. You're right. Um, he was at the Packard Foundation back in the days when we begged for a little bit of money to do a book together begged with and this. Got. <laughs> begged <Yes>. and got. <laughs> um, to, to write up the stories in an engaging way. And I got this amazing Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who was on campus for a year in the Knight Journalism Fellowship Program um, to write that with me and um, write lots of articles in the business press and other places to help increase awareness beyond our tiny community that's otherwise you know, engaged in conservation. But going back to the beginning, um, say a couple of things and then I'd love to have it kind of be informal and we'll open up soon with back and forth. But um, for me personally, I'd say a lot started growing up in West Germany. My dad was in the US military there and we had other connections to Europe through the family. And um, it was incredible when I was in junior high and high school in the 70s and 80s to hear about um, this forest dieback that was occurring across Europe, but um, the press in Germany was all over this. It was a time of a lot of kind of social unrest, a lot of terrorism against Americans for um, all we symbolized then, and um, could talk about what we symbolize now, but back then a lot had to do with um, kind of corporate values taking over the planet in the most negative way and um, also a lot of reflection on um, how things were evolving in um, the environmental movement, the women's movement. There are a lot of things um, tied together then, but acid rain was a trigger and, um, and seeing the forest die back so visibly in a place where the attachments culturally to forests are so tight. You know, people, most of our neighbors went out doing these weekend walks that are very organized um, in Germany on Saturdays and Sundays. And you, here in America, your kids get these, um, we have so many medals at home. Anytime your kid scores a basket or a soccer goal, you get a medal. And in Germany, you get a medal if you've walked two kilometers when you're two years old, you know, and, <laughs> and things. So that got me... Um, together with an amazing high school chemistry teacher really interested in trying to address um, all these challenges on the environment front and scrolling ahead to Stanford days where I came as an undergrad, I, um, I heard of this guy, Paul Ehrlich. I thought he's super famous in Germany. It turns out it's someone who won the Nobel Prize back in the late 1800s. And I thought I was a little bit confused. <laughs> I thought, wow, he's here. I, I didn't realize that, but I'm going to go find him. <laughs> so I, I got um, a great deal of mentoring and oh, many people here, Hal Mooney, Steve Schneider, many others um, in the community here in the room today, uh, 
you know, most of the ideas really. And I'd say a key person in that was Ken Arrow in our economics department, winner of the Nobel Prize. Many of his students won Nobel Prize for their transformative um, work in economics. And so at the end of um, my undergraduate period and early graduate school days, um, Partha Dasgupta came over from the UK, a, a leading economist globally, partly to work with Ken on um, kind of natural capital and sustainability ideas. And it, it was such a, an exciting time. Here I was steeped in the biology department and loving biology, but feeling it was you know, just one thin slice through the complex of issues that we need to address. And having um, these what were evening discussions typically, because these people didn't do anything without a glass of wine. I don't know how, <laughs> it's not always the case, but <laughs> anyway, we even met over wine in the biology department at night in Heron Labs, which is gonna be torn down soon, and that'll be probably the most poignant memory that I will be thinking about the day Heron is bulldozed. But um, these leaders set out a lot of the foundational ideas that we can think of ecosystems as a type of capital asset, um, and just as we have um, other types of assets, whether it's physical, you know, built capital assets like the amazing um, physical dimensions of our institution here, or we've got the human capital, our knowledge, health, and skills that we cultivate um, to the finest levels at an institution like this, or obviously you can think about financial capital in some comparable terms, uh, you know, and social capital, but the natural capital in a way then was really in its infancy in terms of developing institutions that would help um, guide investments in it that would pay off for human development, for livelihoods at individual levels up through to cities and whole countries, how we develop. Um, and we'd really neglected that because humanity came along at a time when, you know, natural capital seemed super abundant. And it was, you know, then in the Great Depression and the two wars, the world wars and such, there was really a focus more on, on labor and, and land as a dimension, you know, limiting and natural capital, but it was much narrower. Um, so times have changed dramatically. And I say I was um, very lucky to come along at a time when all these great thinkers were convening um, in a, a way where all the guard was down in a sense because you're sitting around with, with a bottle of wine and I, I only had one molecule those nights so that I could really pay attention. <laughs> but but chocolate. that's when it got going, right? <laughs> Okay, so but but so that's the sort of setting, right? And here are the inspirations. How did that turn into a concept that became so powerful for you? Um, so and maybe I'm trying to respond in real time and think what were the drivers of wanting to turn those ideas into something actionable, and I. Um, would say a lot of the inspiration came from, again, seeing the problems of acid rain and seeing that science was one thing, that yeah, here the solutions were pretty mm -hmm. obvious from a science point of view, but how do you drive change? Uh, I linked up with people really interested in that, and that included starting pretty early on the conservation NGO world that is you know, geared exactly toward that question, but was also undergoing a lot of change, just recognizing that we weren't going to be able to, um, quote, save the planet by fencing off little areas of um, our life support systems and saying, okay, go for it <laughs> and hope you can support, you know, human numbers and aspirations. So. Yeah, early on, I also, a lot of my biological work was on the likely dynamics of change in nature, biodiversity as a function of changing land use, and then more and more thanks to Chris 
Chris's influence, Steve Schneider's and others, you know, how climate will affect how much land, and I've tried to broaden myself to include water and um, certainly the oceans, though I'm not nearly as good as <laughs> Jim here now yet. <laughs> but, um, you know, and discovering in that work that there was tremendous capacity to support biodiversity and ecosystems that function for many different, um, in many different ways, not only producing agricultural output and livelihoods, but that potentially could function to produce many other types of benefits like climate stability, flood control, water quality for drinking or hydropower supply, or just inputs to the farming that dominates more and more of the planet, such as pollination services to you know, our healthiest crops of fruits, nuts, and veggies and such, or pest control services and so on. And with that recognition in the, um, the basic research, and at the same time having the luck of having started my work there in Costa Rica, an incredible country, led by some real visionaries, including Alvaro Umaña, who did his PhD at Stanford, has degrees in you know, economics, as well as in hydrology and engineering then from Stanford, understanding that his country, Costa Rica, was going to ruin having the highest ever recorded deforestation rates in the tropics at a national level up through the early 90s, and then um, implementing with a tremendous presidential leader back then a plan that has proved so um, kind of almost magnetic in its attraction to pay people for what you want. If you want landholders to produce a wide stream of benefits, you know, find a way to pay for that. And seeing that as a grad student when I was in Costa Rica, meeting the president of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias then, getting to know Alvaro Umaña thanks to his generous spirit and his ties to Stanford, that also showed a way. That and a few other boutique, kind of boutique cases at the time like the decision by New York to uh -huh. invest uh -huh. in um, watershed water. protection to supply the nine million people drinking water in the city um, with safer drinking water. Those um, real world cases were really inspiring and I'd say um, set the course for developing these new approaches to thinking about the harmony between people and nature, the balance the green growth that we're all reaching for of improving the environment at the same time as we improve economic and other dimensions of human well-being. Okay, so I should, I should have said at the beginning, we're going to take the first chunk of time just to talk, and then we're going to open up to you, so please be thinking about what you want to ask as we go, because um, we'll use the second half of the session uh, for for audience discussion um, with Gretchen. Um, so so I, there'll be many people in this room who have lived the NatCap adventure uh, for the last 10 or even 20 years, um, but but for for the rest, I mean, could, do you want to just briefly sketch the arc of this story? I mean, so it starts with this, with these insights in the 90s, really, right, about the importance of ecosystem services of natural capital and the, the possibility of bringing those into decision making. So the adventure since then, just to give us that arc, and then we can talk about some of the big issues you've run into along the way. Great. So, yeah, there's the starting point, laying the conceptual foundation no. with leaders like Ken and Partha in economics and a bunch of leaders on the ecological side and founding ecological economics, having leadership at Stanford like Hennessy and the whole team with whom he worked, driving interdisciplinary um, innovation as a key frontier and opening that up institutionally. It sounds boring, but at one level, but it is crucial to open up um, possibilities here that way and building up the Woods Institute um, as an arena to support and, um, and really activate more work across frontiers that, you know, had never actually been broached before, and that's where a lot of the students in the room I know are, are the, the key figures now. Then the, the boutique cases, and I'd say 
back in the 90s, maybe some hundreds of really inspiring but relatively local and small scale um, decisions were made in real places, you know, by finance ministries, by governments, by development banks, as Jim has pioneered, by more and more corporate leaders to develop meaningful ways of accounting for nature in decision making and actually trying to incentivize conservation and restoration of nature. And then NACAP came along seeing all of these um, inspiring cases that basically proved that this could be done at least on a small scale and in a wide array of arenas and recognizing that what we needed desperately was to develop more of a systematic approach that could be shared, develop sort of a universal language for thinking and talking about this transformation that we could all make together and no one could possibly make on their own. And um, recognizing how much new knowledge was needed to drive the change. And at that time, I was extremely lucky to be invited by um, TNC to join the board. And it's kind of funny looking at you, um, a WWF leader, because at one level, I had always wanted to work for WWF. And after my um, undergrad, I remember I wrote by hand a letter to WWF <laughs> and sent it off begging for a job. And amazingly, someone wrote me back. I couldn't believe it. Some nice person said um, really sweet things about how my aspirations were noble, but I was hopelessly underqualified. And I should go out and get a PhD. And that only took four to six years, <laughs> and so, which seemed like an eternity back when you're 21. But anyway, so thanks to WWF, I kind of went off and yeah, did thanks that. A lot. <laughs> and, um, and then my first chance to get engaged was on the TNC board. And through that, and through a tremendous um, student who ended up becoming sort of chief scientist at WWF US, and with a, a friend and colleague and mentor who was chief scientist at TNC, we decided together to um, tackle this challenge of developing the science, the demonstration cases around the world that would um, aspire to go you know, way beyond the hundreds that had emerged in the mid-90s, and ideally a convening of leaders that we're still working on really. Those are the three things to um, drive change at a much higher level. And so that, those people are Taylor Ricketts, who's now a professor at Vermont, Peter Kariva, who's also now bailed the NGO world and is a <laughs> professor at UCLA, um, and myself. And we, we recognized that the first thing we had to do was get a lot of buddies on board. So the effort started off with actually dozens and quickly hundreds of people, and now is a partnership of about 300 institutions with many people in them working toward this common goal. And we're on the verge of um, scaling this up through the Woods Institute. So that's kind of been the arc. And uh, I could we can get into the, yeah. the details more. Or people can share as we get there. OK. But, now, let's talk about the collaboration part, because one of the breakthroughs, I think, in, in NatCap project was 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 ambitious collaboration. Right? I mean, that it actually was born out of a collaboration with two global NGOs, and has and and that's been an abiding ethic all the way through is to build out those collaborations, which is actually harder than it sounds. So, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, that is. So, w what have you learned along the way, and what has mm -hmm. been rewarding and powerful in those collaborations, and mm -hmm. what's what lessons should the rest of us learn about how to do it well? Yeah, there's a lot one can say there. <laughs> and that um, Jim and I have been able to sit down over coffee and um, reflect on together. But let's say on two fronts, at, at one level, there's the institutional side of it. And I would say in my experience, and this comes from some mentors like Pete Bing, whom I want to mention as someone who, since I was in my early 20s, has kind of helped guide me um, in a lot of practical ways on how the world works. It, we've done 
the, our best work when we're in there as friends. And it sounds less formal and it sounds less um, maybe sustainable, but in a sense, having trust has proven to be the maybe yeah. number one ingredient. Yeah. Uh, there's also a leadership dimension to that, having trust among leaders who can actually affect change in whatever the arena yeah. is. And there's leadership in many different arenas that we're talking about here. So that that's, I'd say, equally important. But it... Um, but it started Thanks as to the Gretchen, trust. Peter, it was Gretchen, Peter, and Taylor. Yeah, way, and we used right? to joke around that we were the tres amigos. Yeah. And um, we were going to do anything we could in our power to win people over to the cause yeah. and um, align our institutions in a way to deliver. And, and that meant changing all three of those institutions, yeah. actually rather dr dramatically, and, and winning people over to the effort. And I... And we worked um, night and day on that together and basically continue to do so in our ever-evolving roles. Um, but that, that was crucial. And I'd say our most successful then getting to actually making change in the world, we've had greatest success in the places where, you know, we had these criteria. We think through theories of change and everything in the abstract. I'm just saying when you get down to business, having trust has proven paramount. And I'm going to mention a book there that I've, I really enjoyed. It'll sound like a weird book to promote. Maybe it's called, I think, A Short History of Economics. It's written by Partha Dasgupta. Hmm. It's about 100 pages put out by maybe Oxford. You can get it in the Stanford bookstore. It's one of these little things you're meant to read on an airplane flight. And I thought, okay, well, I should really know this. I'd read all his 1,000-page books, and I was happy to see a 100-page book. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was going to start out like most economics books, you know, with some supply and demand curves or something like that. In fact, um, it starts out, and this is relevant to all of our discussion, asking, <clears throat> showing pictures of two girls, one girl um, in Ethiopia um, making her way, she's 10 years old, say, 10 to 12, and the similar aged girl in a suburb of Chicago, and asking why the opportunities facing these girls were so strikingly yeah. different. You know, in what ways, and, and at a deep level, why? You know, the depth where then you could hope at a root level you might mm -hmm. um, understand how you could open up more opportunity for the girl in Ethiopia and how we could um, ensure that the girl in the Chicago suburb wasn't part of ruining the planet for everyone. And, um, and what the main, the main theme across the opening chapters and throughout the book is trust. So it's, it was incredible for me. I won't go on about that much more now, but recommend the book as a lens through which you can explain so much about how countries have developed and about prospects for the future. And I think it maybe speaks to something I, when I think about an arena in which I hope to grow more personally, it's, it's on this front, understanding trust better, where it comes from, how to cultivate that. With Chris just back from Bhutan, thinking about <clears throat> the spiritual dimension of our cultures, whether Buddhist and kind of wondering how it's so beautiful at an individual level, and yet in Buddhist countries, some of them like Myanmar or um, Sri Lanka, you see some of the most bloody and terrible violence at a societal level. Anyhow, I feel that arena is absolutely vital, and I hope in our movement, and thinking of Eric Lambin sitting there in his work, a, a little bit in that realm too, on the, the mindset we have toward... Um, one another and uh, the other beings with whom we share the planet. But basically, with all our theories of change, like wanting to develop actionable um, work out in the world, trust has proven to be the main predictor, I think, of success so far. And maybe we need to change that so that it is more replicable widely, but I don't know how feasible that is realistically. But what we've 
developed as, you know, cases where we're looking for around the world opportunity to drive policy change, a circumstance where we have strength and commitment and hopefully trust among all the necessary partners to drive change, and then third, an opportunity to scale up from whatever impact is made in a place. And um, no, so this, I, okay. So let's talk trust because because uh, this is super interesting. You start with actually a very very high trust core, right? Which is you and Peter and Taylor, and from that builds a sort of ring of trust among the core partners through the agents, through those agents, really, right? Enlisting their organizations and building this. So how do you, how does that translate then into a vibrant collaboration among those core partners, but then ultimately around 300 partners, right? Who are able to operate with that kind of trust in the places where you're trying to make change. I mean, how does, how does that? You're laying out um, the next PhD thesis <laughs> topic that yeah, okay. I hope some Volunteers take EI for students yeah. and others <laughs> dive into. <laughs> So that, yeah. I, I think, is out there as an open question yeah. in a way, but it's but also part it. of the culture. Yeah. We've had some people come in and um, help us with strategic planning. We have a yeah. wonderful advisory council yeah. um, on which you know Chuck Katz here serves and others. And there's a recognition pretty quickly among those who get to know the group that there's this spirit of operating at a level of trust and understanding kind of what what is necessary to make um, a collaboration work and endure over the time frame needed at least to drive change and um, so it's something we definitely have as a primary focus in cultivating partnership with others and then in the way we've expanded it's very much been through a network, kind of one by one. We've also tried to, you know, be as strategic as possible and identify places where we need to go and recruit people to the effort who have access so that, again, it's through, in a way, a personal connection um, as opposed to, you know, I guess that's how the world works often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, what we hope to do is drive change as well, sort of more system-wide, and that's through this platform and through, I have two teenage kids who would probably laugh about all this trust stuff. One of them recently told me that you can't read someone's emotions by looking at their face. This has been the most alarming <laughs> thing I've heard <laughs> recently. I was trying to get them off of their digital devices. <laughs> But um, we have a digital platform <laughs> with it's global, their emojis, I think. yeah, it's their yeah. <laughs> with you know data and tools yeah. in which we're trying to codify all the learning that we've developed and empower the many um, partners, the 300 and many more beyond, with whom they're partnered and so on to adopt, but also especially to refine and advance these approaches. So this platform is a core part of the work. And um, so on the one hand, I'm describing this um, pathway that is being advanced through with trust as a primary lens. And then this other where, you know, we've got 185 countries now using our tools. And we don't know the people in many of those places who are actually behind the work. So obviously we need to go viral in a sense and um, have this take off. And that's where we aim to, to drive in the, in the phase ahead. Yeah. So in a way, I mean, you're transcending individual relationships and trust in those relationships to reach 185 countries. So what, is, what are you finding actually inspires country, countries to take this on and do you be serious about using a natural capital approach? And, and I have the same question about companies, of course. Um, yeah. So, well, I'd I mean, love but, to hear your answer but, on companies. <laughs> you first. Um, <laughs> but, but, but what is that? You know, what is it that you find yeah. really gets traction as you? I, I'd say I'm afraid it's mainly crisis. Uh -huh. um, yeah. That crisis is sure. the mother of opportunity, and um, in most of the places where we work, there yeah. there is a real sense of crisis. Yeah. It's easy to find that by opening <laughs> the newspaper today and <laughs> picking your spot. Yeah. But um, I'll take China as an example. China 
we all know has um, hit extremes of human experience um, in a lot of different respects with respect, uh, let's say, to environmental conditions, air and water quality that we all read about, um, and many other dimensions just of poverty and now having um, leadership that is worried about an existential threat to Chinese civilization of the country breaking apart with the very rapid rise in wealth in the eastern provinces and among a few sectors in society and then um, still masses of people steeped in poverty in, in most of the country. So this work in China is framed usually as a national security issue, not as an environmental issue or um, even as a purely human development issue. It's a matter of national security and that's reflected now in their deep commitment at the highest levels of government to transforming the financial system and the whole economy to one of green growth, driving massive um, dollar investments in like real investments. So it's been over $150 billion over about the past 10 years into restoration of ecosystems as one key pathway to securing human well-being, securing the environment, and securing kind of the civilization and the Communist Party. Yeah. So what, what is the role of NETCAP there? I mean, how are you finding a way to help China deliver on that mission? Yeah, we started off with yeah. some um, great friends and partners, both in WWF and TNC, trying to find the pathway. And it took some years um, getting to know people, learning a ton. But then um, through great fortune, and, and again, it was a personal connection, um, an academic connection, coming to someone who um, works directly for the president and premier in the country, though someone who started out as a panda biologist and conservation scientist, who has, I think, deserves all the credit really for opening up what's been possible there. And now the government has um, adopted officially you know, our, our platform for data, for tools, is contributing massively um, in building capacity in China to advance and use these in decisions all across the country that concern um, infrastructure development that uh, so that all major infrastructure projects are vetted, designed around um, natural capital analyses, and um, where 49% of the country is now zoned, having you know using our software um, for restoration of natural capital and investment in livelihood, sustainable livelihood, sort of transformation of local economies into sustainable um, <clears throat> models of, of growth. And um, there's a lot more. A third piece to it, just to mention, is um, developing metrics. You know, we're often flying kind of blind as to how we're, how we're doing on this green growth type of pathway. Um, but developing a new metric called Gross Ecosystem Product, or GEP, that will be reported right alongside Gross Domestic Product, GDP, in evaluating um, basically resource allocation, you know, how to, where to invest, how much to invest in, in um, all sorts of efforts across the country in agriculture, in infrastructure, different sectors of the economy and such. So GEP, if, if you come to the <laughs> Natural Capital Symposium in March, the week of March 19th, you'll meet a high-level delegation from China promoting this. And there are now many other countries who trust China more than they trust the U.S. and other places uh, trying to learn what this is all about and considering adopting it in their own context. And do you see China actually as a... Um, 
a champion for this outside its own borders? I mean, do you see China engaging other countries in helping them follow this direction, or how does that? Yeah, China's investing massively yeah. in um, a lot of things within the country. Um, science is seeing a huge boom within yeah. China. Uh, science writ large, all areas really of learning and kind of building institutions and infrastructure to support um, academic endeavor in a way that's very pragmatically guide, guiding and supporting um, the development aspirations of the country. And outside of China, there's massive investment as well. Mm -hmm. They're in um, fellowship programs in countries all across the world uh, to train people in, um, in sort of frontier areas of knowledge as well as in you know, Chinese culture and have them bring that back much the, uh, the same way that the U.S. you know, really led in over the past you know, 50 or 70 years. But China is so, also investing massively oh, in trade and infrastructure okay, absolutely. Right, outside right. its own borders. Do you see these kinds of ideas factoring into, into that, into its engagement with trade partners? So that's a, a key yeah. open question. I'd yeah. say I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah. Right now, uh, my sense is that China is investing primarily domestically. The problems are so severe domestically. The political pressures are so severe domestically. They're focused on, on that. But at the same time, this whole Belt and Road Initiative, the maritime, you know, and, and land-based, you know, silk roads of the future um, span huge geographies around the planet that, that interest everyone and that are vital to all of our futures. Right now, I don't see an immediate um, application of these principles. They mostly will respond saying, when we bring it up, there's a lot of conversation within NatCap and our Chinese partners. But the government presently um, is saying, well, it's very much up to other country governments to determine yeah. what sorts of investments they accept and seek. Um, but what we're hopeful of is, and what we, our, our strategy is around making this change together in China and how investments are designed, what investments go forward, and you know, bringing natural capital and sustainability into the heart of that arena of decision making, and then um, moving outside of China into the key institutions making those overseas investments and influencing other countries in their own decision making in a big way. So that's everything in China is operates at light speed. So that's in the near term time horizon, but not yeah. there right now. But what what's your perception on that front from having worked intimately with actually the Chinese government in official capacities recently? You mean in terms of where they're headed and engaging yeah. the rest of the world? No, yeah. I think, I mean, we're about to open this up to you guys, so uh, be ready for that. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think your description is is fair. I think China has been um, has been very focused on its own challenges and dealing with what are very acute conservation, ecological, environmental challenges within its own borders, and has only recently been more attentive to Issue, those issues in, the, in its trading partners, in trading and development partners around the world. And I think a bit ambivalent about what role it should be trying to play on those issues. Mm -hmm. And partly for the reasons you suggest, partly as a, out of a recognition of sovereignty, a feeling that you know it's for Indonesia to decide mm -hmm. how to manage its forest. Um, but I, th I think it's a changing landscape, and that's a, it, it's a big question, I think, of how, does, how do these big investment initiatives actually play out? Um, because the impacts could be huge, of course, right? So the stakes are very high. But anyway, I think you're, yeah, you guys are on it. Can I, can I ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up? Uh, tech. I, I mean, as you see, I mean, a lot's changed in the 20 years since mm -hmm. NatCap started in terms of what kind of information is available to scientists, but also decision makers about what's happening in the natural environment, about you know what resources actually are at stake, what services are at stake, and how does how do you uh, how how does that affect what you are doing and can do in addressing natural capital? I'd say at many levels that's yeah. the future that we 
we need to be right on top of that and um, started you know from day one with the vision of having this platform that would enable anyone anywhere to measure in real time the value of benefits to people in their place and to um, understand that value or set of values in meaningful ways to in, inform decisions in a huge array of contexts. And that would all be powered through advances in technology. So we've built this um, data and software platform and aim now to make it the frontier go-to place for getting that information. Succeeding in that will hinge on innovation that many of the people in the room are driving in um, things like remote sensing, being able to detect at a very fine scale and in real time changes in conditions and processes in Earth's surface that um, we can then translate through new science, a whole bunch of frontier areas actually into implications for human well-being. One of those frontier areas is um, just health. We've been good at describing, for example, how a change in a landscape, um, cutting down a forest or restoring a forest, for example, might affect water quality. And then we can imagine how that's going to affect health. But it um, will be a lot more powerful if we can go all the way to this is how many kids you know, and workers and such are at, at risk and in these ways from change in landscape. So there, that's one example. Another key arena is just in AI, and I'd love to hear you take off on this too because I know of your interest, Jim. But developing, um, you know, things that we can almost um, imagine more in a science fiction kind of realm today, but, but that are coming rapidly where... Um, in the ideal, wherever you were in the world, e even in the most data poor areas, um, you would be able to have this access. And it, at some levels, it's like opening up the way the printing press opened up um, in a very democratizing way what, what was known back in the day and how some of the earliest books made available to society back then, you know, were from by the ancient Greeks and mathematics and in, in other realms of knowledge that were so fundamental then to kind of the Renaissance and um, opening up, you know, all that we've had since then in, in human aspiration and development. And I, I feel we're on the cusp, but I'm probably, you're probably mm, yeah. better versed at describing the science fiction, <laughs> but the dream yeah. that we have in um, being able to sense what's going on anywhere and to hold our own selves kind of accountable in our day-to-day -day choices and to hold bigger institutions, whether governments or corporations or others, ac accountable for choices as well by making visible those connections and um, you know just how things are are yeah. going for nature and for people around the world yeah really great okay so the floor is open this is how it works the, uh, Roberta and Athena have microphones so the key is to get the microphone because then you'll get the floor <laughs> so they're in charge um, but raise your hand so they know who to give the microphone to questions I was told when I taught our systems 10, I should count to 10 while I wait for people to raise their hand. So okay. we'll count to 10. Don't be shy. Yes, Suki. Do I get the microphone? Yes, you do. Oh, oh, there it is. OK. So you just said something that was really fascinating to me about technology, artificial intelligence. And I was just spinning around saying, so what is the world going to look like when all humans have access to all knowledge? Isn't that coming? On, you're going to have some means. <laughs> Maybe it's because I have teenagers. I'm a little doubtful, <laughs> but <laughs> that will have the attention <laughs> yeah. and control over our attention to focus on. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of the little girl. But, oh, no, I'm sorry. kidding. Why don't you? I'm just thinking your point of the little girl in Ethiopia mm -hmm. and the gulf between her future 
and mm -hmm. what she has access to, resources, knowledge. Mm -hmm. But coming in the future, isn't it possible that she would actually have access to all True. knowledge, the accumulated wisdom of the planet? So, yeah, on that, um, I'm, I'd love to hear other comments. Let me just make a start um, in playing out what implications might be. At one level, um, it opens potential that is really not there for so many people in so many places, including right, right here in Silicon Valley, to improve the world in the ways we hope for. At another level, though, so much of what is required to realize the potential in knowing what's going on in the world, the potential to drive change, it hinges on governance and whether we cooperate and what some of the root um, causes today are of the traps that we see places in, that knowledge is one key to unlocking these sort of social or poverty types of traps, but it's only one key. And there's a lot more that AI might never tell us about um, you know, changing culture, changing the way we interact individually and across societies, and uh, kind of why I touched initially on on trust or on, there, there are other dimensions of it at an individual level, a, a compassion, you know, and a focus, and partly why I joked about um, whether with um, complete access, say, to some dimensions of knowledge, we would act uh, as the homo sapiens we are any more uh, wisely say with respect to the goals that we share probably here in this room. I think that's an open question, but there certainly is, you know, and you can look, it's been said a lot, but say at the Arab Spring, just opening up a place <laughs> all of a sudden doesn't uh, create the institutions we need to, um, whether they're formal or more informal, whether they're kind of in governance or in say more of the private sector, public or private sector, or more maybe in even religious or other kind of realms, that we need to cultivate a shared vision of where humanity is heading and where we could head and inspire movement toward you know, a positive vision of this green, green growth or how we could phrase it a lot better than that. Um, so I, I think there's a long way we could go, but definitely um, that's just one of the necessary keys to uh, the future we all hope for. So can you build that up for a second? Because the, the because many of the places that are most important, for whether from a biodiversity perspective or a development perspective, are places where governance is is weak, right? And and how have how have you come to grips with that in the context of NetCap? I mean, how do you actually help get these kinds of approaches in place in, in situations mm -hmm. where government actually isn't mm -hmm. as strong and capable as it is mm -hmm. in the U.S. or even in China? So the, quote, shortcut that we've um, <laughs> taken through the Natural Capital Project so far has been to um, do two things. One is operate with institutions that have more strength and in our case, I'd say often it's been with development and aid types mm -hmm. of organizations that can come in and deliver, um, even in a situation where there isn't the capacity locally to act more independently. So with the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, we have uh, many efforts underway in countries that um, wouldn't have the resources or capacity to make any use of the natural capital project otherwise. And the second, um, this is more of a, a long cut, is to build slowly the capacity needed there. And that's what made me go off earlier when you asked whether China, how they were investing overseas. It's um, 
that investment in building human capacity to use the knowledge that we create collectively around the world is is so vital and um so we have a a major training program both online and um going around the world we have henry back there somewhere who can speak to this but um leading between one and two trainings per month in different regions of the world that um, otherwise just wouldn't really have access to this and in our natural capital symposium coming up in march we've invited people and and had them come from typically about 30 countries worldwide and we aspire to doing a lot a lot better in that but uh you know and really building up capacity in the 185 where you know there's at least one human being at the end of a terminal um interacting with what we have online Good. but chime in others on this these are these are tough questions go for it thank you um, with the mic excuse me i've got a bit of a cold so um uh, i'm going to struggle through my question a little bit um i really liked your comments about trust i thought they were really interesting um and Yesterday, actually, it was a really interesting forum on, on forest finance, talking about uh, Red Plus getting money. Um, and it was an interesting conversation between um, some very large uh, corporations uh, and heads of government. And there was, a, there was an exchange between um, a, an oil company executive and the vice president of Guyana um, talking about um, <coughs> a potential project, a forest financing project. Um, and one of the key issues I think that came up in that discussion was this issue of trust, um, thinking about, um, you know, what, what, what really kind of was at stake, um, uh, or what, sorry, what the real incentives were, I guess, for, for private finance of, 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 of natural capital. So I was wondering <clears throat> whether you could expand a little bit on, um, uh, I guess, your reflections on how to kind of build trust in, in terms of getting um, a reconceiving of, of, I guess, a way, ways that um, a lot of governments sort of think about, um, about nature um, and, and, and thinking about getting, um, uh, and thinking also about the way in which, um, yet, you know, they can uh, uh, finance efforts to, to, to protect nature. Okay, <laughs> you've, yeah, you've asked a really good question that's right at the core of what we're thinking about now, and I, I'll make a quick pass at it and then welcome other perspectives and comments from Jim and others. So at one level, what we need to demonstrate is that all of this can sort of work somehow, all of this meaning um, shining a light on the intimate connections between people and nature, and then developing um, successful models that move that, you know, understanding into practice and enable people living out across landscapes or maybe making their livelihoods in um, coastal margins and other places, enabling them to kind of embody what we what we hope for to run their livelihoods, their businesses, their enterprise in a way that um, drives restoration or conservation of the ecosystems that we all depend on. It, it depends on kind of that whole chain, the understanding and then the economic incentives and enabling kind of, of um, greater options for landholders or fisher people or whomever, it comes down to sort of ecosystem by ecosystem, seeing an option there to um, either exploit it the way that we have done in recent times and through much of human history, converting it from a relatively more natural state that might provide a wider array of life support systems, you know, or, or, or go back so that we net, you know, have the mix of extraction and also just generation of basic services and to to achieve that um, I think these demonstrations that are what we need today that it can work such as through red plus 
reduced emissions um, through From deforestation, it, deforestation and degradation. Yeah. But um, and the plus adding really a human development component. And the, the example you bring up of Red Plus as a mechanism, I think, is key for the second point, which is that up to now, the demonstrations we've had have been um, quite, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, kind of little one-offs here and there, each one unique, each having its own characteristics. And I see that as a necessary stage understanding what's really needed in a place and trying to build a success there. And you're going to come up with something that then, you know, fit that particular place, say in, in Bolivia, where one of the first red projects was developed. But then how do we systematize from that? And the systematizing, the f trust is elevated first by having a success. Okay, we, we did it in Bolivia. That's great. But then how do we scale up? That's going to require a lot more formal agreement and formal support for the different stages in the process, um, all the way from that landholder, say, um, doing small-scale farming, who has the option now of instead accepting a payment and reforesting in order to uh, you know, capture more, sequester carbon and help secure global climate. There are a lot of steps there, getting the science right, getting um, some kind of validation that each step along the way that you're measuring sort of any return on investment in a credible, repeatable way around the world and that others will buy into this system, that you can monitor whether those on the ground have been complying and all of that. And I'd say we're at the beginnings of um, developing these more formal systems. And it, it, it sounds kind of maybe dull and somewhat technocratic, but it, and, it, and there's so many devils in the details there, actually. And it relates to, Jim, your work in the whole supply chain arena, mm -hmm. you know, where traceability is also a key dimension. Being able really to know through sensing systems and, um, and understanding looking at Eric here to commodity flows and that what an investment made in one place isn't just going to lead to sort of deforestation pressure in the next weaker um, <laughs> place in terms of governance. So I feel we've got to push on those two frontiers. That's, no, we, I'm going to let the floor okay. <laughs> so over here in this corner and then Eric. This is fascinating and exciting. I'm wondering to what degree you have explored uh, extending the workshops you've mentioned to even um, online degrees and in all 200 countries, uh, and perhaps even in um, sort of an ecosystem platform that might dovetail with Google Street View, with Time Slider, with Maps, with Earth, um, and at the cellular and atomic levels. Uh, in such a way that um, you might build, grow, grow out of Stanford students teaching sort of these online degrees and also mm -hmm. um, MIT OpenCourseWare and Stanford Coursera and things like that, extending the teaching aspect for natural capital. You're, you're tremendous to bring that up. That, that's a major part of our aspiration, and I'm kind of proud to say that the team led by Henry and, and some others have um, developed really early on, one of the first online courses. Weirdly enough, we, you should correct me if I'm wrong, Henry, but we developed it um, with the Department of Defense. We initially had um, funding. We're always strapped for funding, and we had funding from the U.S. Department of Defense to um, <laughs> develop some new ecosystem service models. So looking at the benefits of natural landscapes for um, troop training and that sort of thing. Um, so we did that, but then at the same time, it enabled us to put a lot of this online and we've expanded it to, you know, serve many different audiences. We've translated a lot of our stuff into Spanish and into Chinese. Want to go a lot further with that global reach and that vision, have other courses and eventually, yeah, really build up the um, educational arena for anybody worldwide, ideally, to engage in. With respect to Google, we want to make our platform much, much more accessible. 
we've got all the, the internal engine, I feel, tuned up as best as we can, given the state of science. But um, you've got to be kind of a smiling geek to work with it. <laughs> it's, um, you know, just requires a lot of technical expertise. The question is how much will ever make it that simple. You wouldn't want heart surgery going on by for everybody. I don't want my brother coming over and doing heart surgery on me. And so at some levels, there's always going to be a certain level of technical expertise required. But we're actually convening tomorrow again at Google to explore um, teaming up further with the Earth Engine team to make the front end, the user interface of our software much more appealing, accessible, and kind of attractive and empowering. So you've hit on a lot of key objectives. Thank you. Eric. <clears throat> so NatCap has worked very hard to engage the private sector. So what has been your experience with respect to the motivation, the commitment of these large companies on sustainability and, and the natural ecosystem, natural capital approach? Yeah, I'll give two quick perspectives on that, and then I'd love you and uh, Jim to say something there. On, on, on the one hand, I'd say we've gone quite far with some leaders in the private sector, and I'll mention two specifically. One is um, Dow Chemical Corporation, and then a second is Unilever Corporation. In both cases, we've not only... Um, pioneered some new science that has spread through the corporation. In the case of Dow, it was initially to look at, it's pretty ironic, but their main plant in Texas is right along the Gulf Coast and the spot that has the highest predicted return frequency for severe hurricanes. And um, so they're asking whether they should maintain this marshland in between the plant and the coast, you know, just this kind of small strip of marshland. And um, the answer, working together with them and their engineers, and incidentally, that was a huge exercise in trust building and all <laughs> uh, touching on some of the challenges, but coming to the common language and understanding and developing a systematic way of valuing marshland as um, uh, an, a dimension of the insurance there for the plant showed that the marshland alone was not going to protect that plant from sea level rise and the storm and other um, climate extreme events expected in the near term, but that uh, keeping the marsh would greatly reduce the cost of physical sort of gray infrastructure investments that would be needed to secure that plant. So. Um, from that point, um, Dow both decided in favor of maintaining the marsh and in favor of looking at all of their um, major research and capital investments through this natural capital lens. And they've developed their own internal science to do this. And more briefly, I'll say with Unilever, with whom Jim's worked extensively, um, we developed a new kind of life cycle assessment that incorporates carbon, water, and biodiversity in looking at product design and sourcing decisions. We started happily with Ben and Jerry's ice cream and the question of whether petroleum-based or bio-based plastics <laughs> should be used to package that up. And that now, the hard part, this is the other side of the coin, so we've had some success there, but it there's not some miraculous overnight transformation. Yeah. And how to um, mainstream across a company, much less across a sector, remains elusive to us. And with a bit of worry that um, that arena might not be the most high value, provide the highest return in terms of driving change in the near term, we've you know, we've not invested as heavily as we might there. It's also that our team, we don't have the types of business savvy people we need to drive further with those corporations. But all of the work is very recent, published in 2017 and such. So, so there's scope, but I'd love 
to hear your perspective on how far we can go with the private sector versus um, the value in focusing more on driving policy change in the public sector that might mobilize more, activate more on the private side. Do you want to say anything about that, Eric? Okay, so <laughs> that actually leads to, does anyone have a mic? Okay, um, can I just ask a quick follow-up question? But take the mic because we're coming to you. Um, one of the, I think, I mean, one of the advantages. I hate to say this with Chris here. One of the advantages of climate action is at least there are a couple of core metrics that are very clear, mm -hmm. right? Carbon emissions, temperature, CO two concentrations. It, in biodiversity, it's always been a bit more complicated, mm -hmm. right? And and so what you've seen is companies gravitate towards commitments like zero deforestation. Right or certification, which has complexity underneath, but is mm -hmm. you know at least easily understood. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so how does how does natural capital break through in that kind of context? Is it do you see companies making the same kinds of commitments to natural capital conservation, or, or is it something that they just build into the way they do business? I mean, what's the pathway there? So there too often. We've okay. Here I'm giving a perspective partly from the Nature Conservancy. I see um, a key person here working there, but it's I've worked a lot with Mark Tursik, head of TNC, mm -hmm. for a long time, and and he brought this up in his um, plenary address to the symposium we ran last spring that he had hoped. Here we get to the trust in the individual level again. Um, to inspire a lot of colleagues to kind of change their careers. A lot of people in, he came from Goldman Sachs, um, but he hoped to bring people over from, say, really successful private sector careers into conservation. And he's been very successful within TNC in attracting mm -hmm. um, leaders who had 20 to 30 year careers in um, the private sector internationally into key roles in TNC. But he was saying this is an arena where he feels disappointed that many, many, many of his buddies are instead kind of retiring to nice lives with very little interest in moving into conservation or other um, causes such as this. And I, I think unless we get real change in leadership, it's it's going to be a harder slog, and it will require um, <clears throat> much more action on the public policy side to mm -hmm. drive that change. And then when it comes to um, actually implementing it in terms of metrics, I I <clears throat> see two things. At one level, companies often come with one problem, like the marsh, and that's um, a good initial hook to explore together, see if you can not only solve that problem, but understand more broadly how the approach could be developed to cultivate a much deeper transformation that maybe is happening in Dow and maybe in Unilever, thanks to leadership mm -hmm. from the top, mm -hmm. plus some of these pressures. But in terms of metrics, I think ultimately will um, pay a big price if we don't pay attention to the full system of accounts that we need on natural capital. I think there can be um, kind of simple ways of getting into this with a focus on the, the one thing that maybe is the most burning. But if a company ran itself looking at yeah. just one metric, there'd be a lot of vulnerability. And um, similarly, I think running the planet, <laughs> the ecosystems we need will require keeping an eye on a whole suite of metrics and basically a system of accounts just like we have for economies in, say, the national income accounting system and such. But then we can wrap that up, hopefully, into simple, actionable metrics like in China, the GEP, gross Eco ecosystem product idea, behind which there'll be a much more sophisticated and full kind of set of accounting. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, building upon the topic of trust and, and some of the other underlying themes that you mentioned, one of the things that I've learned, uh, thanks to opportunities of being here like at Stanford with many people all over the world, is how people uh, across a country or across the, 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 the world have very different relationships with the environment mm -hmm. and perceptions and, and uh, 
belief of what it represents for them. Uh, so I was wondering if you could potentially comment on sort of the values embedded within the Natural Capital Project or other uh, um, international organizations on conservation that you work with, and how do they sometimes fit or clash or encompass uh, I don't know, the, the value system mm -hmm. and priorities of the stakeholders mm -hmm. that you work with? Mm -hmm. You're asking uh, another really key question that um, we could talk about for hours, and I'll, I'll try to give a, a take a quick pass at it. I'd say at the most important level, what we aim to do within the Natural Capital Project is open awareness, not to prescribe ever what the values ought to be in a place, because I think that will backfire at every level, really. Um, instead, it's to start to cultivate a change in societal awareness that will likely take decades at a minimum to unfold of those intimate connections between our own well-being and a society's well-being and nature and hope that with that awareness um, eventually we get to a point of um, you know those places that survive through an evolutionary process especially you know of managing um, in a more sustainable way now to accelerate that process and avert the worst types of disasters um, we aim to showcase win-win kinds of outcomes that achieve what everybody hopes for and what a kind of common sort of universal values of um, wanting food security basically whether it's in food or energy or job and economic measures, health, climate, all of the dimensions of security that we think about. And starting at that common level, cultivate um, an awareness where it has to come from, in some ways, ultimately, people um, whose day-to-day -day choices influence whether we have rainforest left in the world or coral reef or and it's all of us it's our day-to-day -day choices and what kind of vehicle we drive here in silicon valley say and it's our and what sort of food we buy and it's day-to-day -day choices of, among um, artisanal fisher people and people working the land so it's a daunting um, problem because it does involve all of us ultimately to accelerate as well, hoping not only to cultivate a win-win sort of vision, but a, an approach that's very adaptable, that on the one hand has some universal elements, like, well, with these um, parts of the machinery of nature, you know, we, we can live healthy um, and happy lives. So getting that clear as a kind of a universal but then how we live the lives and all is going to come down to the particular place. And I think neglecting the diversity in culture, history, um, and institutions, formal and informal and all, in places will, would spell the ruin of the whole effort. So it's very much um, a final point to say that we've developed this um, in a way that makes me it's very emotional and um, very admiring of people on on the team across all the partners. Very much um, a co-developed kind of approach to understand the problem, both from that universal level, but also from the on the ground. How would so a lot of our work, to give you an example, in China is interviewing thousands of people living often a two days hike from the nearest road where a bus might ever go by and take somebody to a, a place where you could buy something. Going out and interviewing, and there are many students who come to Stanford and you know, improve their statistics and other methodology, but the other half of them is out there making that two-day hike to find the grandmother who's living with a grandchild in the rural part of, say, Xi'an, um, looking at my friend 
uh, here, Ming Wei in the audience, um, but going out and understanding how she makes her livelihood choices, whether she goes and takes from the forest to cook her breakfast that morning or whether she has any other option, and how could her life you know, be improved through these, these investments that are now being made in China. So just the devil will be in those details, but I think at, through a place like Stanford and our global effort, we can work a lot on the universalizing side of this and cultivate capacity in all the places around the world that will need to work it out in individual ways. We're going to draw a line there. I can't. I can't imagine a better way to wrap up uh, this session than than uh, than what Gretchen just said, and, and it, it <coughs> makes clear, I think, to all of you, why this concept of natural capital has been so transformational. I, I would say more transformative, maybe even disruptive. Uh, than any other concept in, uh, in this last couple of decades, and the way we think about nature, and the way we think about its place in our society, and in laying the groundwork for actually creating a society that the Earth can sustain. Um, so if you want to know more, the Natural Capital Symposium is four weeks uh, away. Uh, hundreds of Gretchen's colleagues, uh, some of whom are in the room, but hundreds more will be here to work through these issues. And it's, it's an opportunity not to miss if you want to know more about the work they're doing. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking uh, Gretchen for this conversation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.